Hi, hello everyone, and um, apologies for the delay uh, in starting. Um, we had a few technical difficulties. Today, I'm pleased to have with me Annie Mutamba, who is the principal and co-founder of Meridia Partners, a leading advocacy and strategic comms firm that specializes in EU-Africa relations in Brussels. She's also co-founder of Africa Communications Week, a global platform for comms professionals that are passionate about the strategic transformation of the continent through communications. I'm also really happy to have um, with us uh, Professor Gail Allard, who is the Professor of Economic Environment and Country Analysis at IE Business School in Madrid. She has also served as Vice Chancellor for Research at IE University. I would also like to welcome Felicia Appenteng, who is the chair of IE University's Africa Center, an academic and research center whose mission it is to shine a light on African solutions to global challenges. We also have with us um, Eloine Barry, founder and CEO of African Media Agency. African Media Agency is a Pan-African agency that specializes in helping companies grow their share of voice across um, Africa. Before we kick off, just a little note um, to the audience. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, if you have questions uh, for the speakers, please put them in the chat and we'll address them during the Q&A, which will happen directly after um, after the conversation. So great, Eloine, thank you for being here. Um, I see you're still on mute. I'm about to kick off by asking you, um, you know, we're discussing the role of impact um, and narratives on Africa's development and transformation, right? Um, I see that over the last few years, it appears that there's a stronger drive to push for and shift for narratives of the continent. How do you, um, how do you see or how have you seen this conversation evolve um, in the past uh, few years? Could you share your thoughts with us? Sure. Thank you, Nyela. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so you're right, there, there is a shift and it's definitely a positive one. And I always like to use this sort of personal story. So that happened to me um, almost 15 years ago, actually. I was working in London um, for an international company and I was leaving to start a venture in Africa, in PR. And so my boss sent out an email, you know, saying that I was leaving, explaining that I was going to work um, in Africa. The following day, a lovely colleague of mine, um, I bump into him in the kitchen, so we're making a cup of tea, and he goes, oh, I heard you leaving. Um, we're going to miss you, but it's so amazing that you're going to do that. I heard that you're, you're going to work for a charity in Africa. So the perception then, 15 years ago, was if you are going to work in Africa, it has to be aid-based. It has to be a charity. There's no business. You know, you're going to help and to, I don't know, work in health or give food away. <laughs> so I think from that perspective, things really look a lot better. Um, but I think that, you know, when we talk about narrative, it's such a big word and it's also a word that we use a lot. And I think might be a little bastardized, but what it is essentially is the way we tell a story. It's the way we tell a story about a place, the way we tell a story about a person. And I think that as much effort that we make, we have to make, and I really strongly believe that it's, it's also coming from our own place, that where we need to really work on our own narrative. There are some things happening on the continent that do shift the way people view this. And this is inevitable. It's the future. It's the youngest continent. We now have unicorns on the continent. We keep on talking about Flutter Wave this week. You know, there are some developments happening that does help better um, the narrative. Um, so, yes, I think the story is looking a lot better, um, but there still is a lot of work um, that needs to be done. Um, on that front. 
Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Elohim. Um, what are the implications of this of these negative narratives, right? So you you gave an example of um, you know perception that your um, colleague had about you know you know when you were moving to this. Uh, to to start a venture across the continent, but what are the implications of these negative narratives globally um, and in the U.S. Uh, in particular? So I will maybe I'll 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 swing that question to Felicia and Elowin. Maybe if you have some thoughts on that afterwards, you can you can uh, jump in on. That. Yeah, yeah, certainly, of course. So uh, as someone whose family is from Ghana, but I grew up here in the U.S. One of the ways that I think that we see the impact of this most keenly I'm happy is to jump in uh, when Felicia um, comes back. Um, so, you know that. Oh, um, I think there's a. I think Elohim. I think there's a a, fee, a little bit of a, a delay. So Felicia was was jumping in to respond to the question. Great, <laughs> no problem. I got scared for a second. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no worries. I got nervous. Okay, all right. No, no. So I mean, you know, it's a it's a delay, and but thank you for for for, for covering for me, uh, Elohim. Um, yeah. So one of the I think that we see this are the most in the U.S. really is in the education system. Um, and so what we see is that there is a real dearth of material and things that are taught in a meaningful way about both Africa and Afro-descendants. And we know that the consequences uh, of that uh, for children who are brown and black, but you know, also sort of all children uh, in general, it really... It, it limits the way that you see your own self possibilities. Um, it limits the way that you see the world. And it also, frankly, limits your full understanding of the way that the U.S. was built. Um, and you can see so many of these narratives uh, in a particular impact how we craft policy. So I'll give you sort of one of my favorite uh, examples, right? A, a typical headline for a, a report might be, African Americans rarely get loans from banks, right? But actually, the real flip is is that frequently banks deny. Not- Thanks, Felicia, Elohim. Um, so another, so it's it's interesting how I I actually cannot hear Felicia, and I was thinking to myself, I was thinking, um, it's amazing how we think that internet connections are bad in Africa, but I'm based in New York, and it seems that I would probably be better off in Abidjan this morning. So Felicia, forgive me if I'm repeating some of what you just said, but what I wanted to uh, basically say on the whole story. Um, is it's all about the perception that we have. And I think if, if you are going to tell the story of someone that you know, that you met, or that you've heard of that's violent and that is starving and that is a bit lazy, would you even want to meet that person? Would you even want to spend five minutes, even do you even have the curiosity to know more about this person? And I think... Africa has been depicted in that light, probably for various reasons. I think it is also easier to portray Africa in this light because it sort of justifies the abuse that the continent's been going through. Um, but I, I, and I also believe that there is a sad story to tell around, um, you know, the media and 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 what has been frustrating us in our line of business. Um, we and that's it's it's actually there's two things i was i was looking at my notes this morning and i, I you know I, ha- I had like points to make to make and then i received a text um from someone who runs a really large uh media in nigeria telling me i am stuck i can't find my lead story do you have anything for me so I'm like yes i do you know i do have something for you i've got Congo issuing their first bonds. I've got um, a fund investing in fintech um, in Ghana and and Nigeria. This is all great. And his response to me was, no, 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 no. 
a lead story has to be negative. <laughs> and that happened 15 minutes before I logged in, so I had to mention that story. So there's that. And there's then, you know, when you dig deeper and when you're trying to do your job and you have clients coming to you and saying, no, no, don't, I don't want any interview with. the media that portray that negative story and this is who we want to pitch to but then there has been actually a report that was issued by africa no filter who does a tremendous job at you know really trying to help better the narrative of the continent and what came back is that a third of the stories that are being run by national publications within africa are actually picked or aggregated from this international media so we ourselves carry on these negative stories for various reasons. It costs a lot of money to produce stories. We don't have, you know, correspondence based throughout the continent. So we rely on international media for all of this. But there, there is that sort of vicious circle. Um, so it, it's, it doesn't look good internationally. It, it really doesn't. That's so true. Um, that's so true, Eloine. And actually, that leads me to my next question, which is for Annie. Um, so, Annie, you're a public affairs and communications expert. Um, what role then does comms practice have to play in shifting the narrative? So, Eloine's just given us, you know, some of sort of back, you know, what's happening in the back in the back rooms. I would say, <laughs> what role does does comms have to play in shifting this narrative? How can we change this? Yeah, um, and I want to come back to what Eloine just said, because she also basically described the fact that as communication professionals, we're also part of the problem. Uh, the good news is we should be also part of the solution, because there's a real need for for Africa-focused communicators to be strategic and really intentional about the types of stories we put out there. This is something that we keep saying um, uh, through Africa Comes Week, that's our starting point, really. We're not just talking about fighting stereotypes, uh, but really how to gradually and collectively also shape a discourse that is very, that is really vital to, um, to Africa's um, and Africa's economic transformation. It's pretty clear for everyone, and uh, Eloine and also Felicia also pretty much highlighted um, the fact that negative perceptions of the continent and of African countries can have all sorts of consequences, uh, the economic, political, also social consequences across the, the continent. And um, sadly, we didn't have to wait for 2020 to give us a flurry of examples in that area. Now, the thing is, it's 2021 and we don't have much time. Uh, we're talking about problematic narratives, but they all have an impact on real life on people's health, people's security, um, and ultimately whether or not people can access opportunities that are out there. And I mean, those narratives have very tangible consequences. If we look at the three prevailing narratives today about Africa at the global level, um, what are those narratives that have shaped uh, the perception of the region uh, over the past decades, let's say? Peace? or security or conflict resolution, depending on how you want to frame it. Uh, eight, Lewin just mentioned that, right? Development with everything that's attached to that very loaded word. And also now it's a pretty recent economic diversification and, um, and investment. Now, as communication, I mean, communication professionals, should they then amplify those narratives or suggest alternative perspectives. That's a real choice. It's not an easy one, but it's strategic. And that's where communicators can really play a very important role um, because we're not only beneficiaries of the continent's success, we should really be key players and um, sort of stakeholders in that transformation. That's very, that's a very, very interesting, interesting point, right? Because we do, we do have to be intentional. We do have to think about, um, make strategic decisions about how we want to push those narratives and maybe also in line with, um, 
you know, in line with um, the objectives even of, you know, national governments, for example, right? So these are not also decisions taken in isolation, but, you know, in view with, with governments and corporates to, to have a vision of where, you know, we would like our countries or our nations to go. So that's, that's, that's completely right. And, and I think maybe one of the major challenges even, you know, and just thinking about what you were saying, Annie, around um, this decision about how to be strategic or where to be strategic um, in what narrative to push is around the lack of data, right? Um, and this is something that I know that um, Africa Comes Week and IE Africa Center are hoping to address um, through their joint research project on media and on narratives um, and development on the impact and the link between narratives and, and development. So um, can you tell us, Annie, a little bit why you decided to embark on this project? And I'll also ask Felicia about this as well. Um, yeah, pretty quickly, um, you know, in this conversation about perception, narrative, reputation, especially when we talk about a continent, I always t like to take a step back. It's a serious challenge for all countries and regions in the world. Um, there's absolutely no country or region, especially now, that is not struggling with their reputation, you know, to some, to some extent. And COVID has made things a little worse for, uh, for most of them uh, that haven't seen this crisis as an opportunity to step up their game. I was following um, an interesting conversation with um, communication uh, professionals in the Middle East and how they are also looking for ways to shift the regional narrative. So we're pretty much, you know, in the same boat uh, right now. What the African continent is really lacking right now is an infrastructure. Um, an infrastructure to tackle that issue. There are lots of ideas for solutions out there, um, and we all know them. You know, some would say we need an African CNN or Al Jazeera. Others would argue that uh, the African Union should lead on communication. I think all of that is valid. What we are really missing, I mean, from our point of view, uh, comes down to two things, coherence and data. Um, coherence, because we've all seen and we've been there, we've seen Africans from around the world uh, raising concerns, fighting um, uh, stereotypes, concerns about the continent's reputations uh, through various means, on different channels, on different topics, in different contexts. Uh, all those efforts are very valid and super important to shift the narrative of Africa, but they are mostly isolated. So coherence is really lacking. And the second area is data. As you said, we can attempt to shift that narrative, but it has to be fact-based, right? Um, we're talking about perceptions and the mismatch that exists between millions of different African stories and the way they are related. And in that context, because that includes behavior change, I think it's important to look at facts, data, and what can be changed realistically? I mean, we have to be super realistic, right? Um, so these are the two areas where it is really necessary now. And I want to come back to that sense of urgency. We're really, you know, we don't have much time to be strategic and intentional and um, reacting to current events or misrepresentation is one thing. And social media is really helping there. But where is the strategy? And how do we want to build a strategy without data? And that's basically where this research comes in. Thanks, thanks, Annie. Felicia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 tough to uh, to uh, follow that. Um, I mean, uh, I would say from the perspective of the Africa Center, uh, we always really try to go back to our mission to really define our our scope of of work. And so, for us, that mission is to shine a light on African solutions to glo to global challenges. Really, what we know is key is that if we're actually going to do that, that language and storytelling are really central to that challenge. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you think about language as sort of being the tool for all of us to really, you know, sort of see how we relate to the universe and then storytelling as our way to see ourselves, our people, and everything else, then we have to look at those two things together because basically what we see oftentimes for the continent is how uh, the story that is incomplete at best limits global progress and limits our possibilities. 
Um, and so we really wanted to begin to gather this data so that we could sort of take this feeling and hunch that we all had and all know in a very deep way to be true, to be able to actually quantify it in a, in a meaningful way to then offer tools to people who want to be a part of the solution. Great, thanks. So um, this moves me to something that I'm really passionate about this, <laughs> about this work. And uh, so Gail, um, you are the lead professor on this project, um, um, this ACW, IE Africa Center project. I, um, could you share with us, you know, the methodology and the experience so far? So, I mean, I guess my question that Elohim alluded to this, how do you begin to even define what narrative is, right? And then how do you go about establishing links between narrative and, you know, economic success or development? You know, share with us a little bit more about this. Yeah. Thanks, Aniola. And and I want to thank um, all of you for sharing. Uh, it was a privilege to be on the panel with with uh, a group of women like you. Um, I just, what uh, Eloween has just mentioned really resonates because, you know, all countries are suffering with, you know, what their narrative looks like. Um, I'm an American and I have watched that all my life. Um, and I remember living in Southern Europe for many years. I remember the Eurozone crisis when immediately any country in the South was tossed by financial markets into the club med basket and they sold their bonds. And so, you know, these things can have huge implications for a country uh, financially, economically. So um, with this project, which is really exciting and I'm, I'm so thrilled to be part of it, the question we had to ask ourselves is, um, what is narrative? Uh, you know, underlying issues, of course, can we control it with social media, et cetera? But we had to say, what, you know, what is a narrative and how can I measure it? And here we move into the area of political discourse analysis, which is a really uh, groundbreaking area, um, the application of computer uh, technology to to speech, to to language. And um, what we did was we decided to take three countries just to start as our pilot. We used Ghana, Rwanda, and um, Uganda, all countries that have had major initiatives to try to change the image, the narrative of, of their countries. You know, Uganda Vision 2040, the Made in Rwanda, Made in Ghana, the Year of the Return. Um, and we decided to... Um, to focus on presidential speeches. There were a lot of different sources of narrative about countries, so this was difficult. But we decided in order to do something homogeneous with every country, in order to get social media out of there, and in order to try to reflect what the country is communicating, trying to communicate about itself, not what media are saying about it. We stuck with presidential speeches. Um, we figured that these were scripted in a way that they would be trying to reflect the country's aims and goals and strategies. Um, of course, there are issues here. Initially, we wanted to do Ethiopia, and the speeches were in Amharic on the um, public websites. And so, you know, just the trouble of, of um, adequately translating them was in, an immediate problem. Some speeches are in video. We don't have a transcript. There are different numbers of speeches available for countries. So all of this was very complicated, but we narrowed it down to presidential speeches that were available in text. We had about 100 per country for the years 2015 to the first quarter of 2020. Uh, that's because the project ended there, but we've decided it probably would be best as we continue with this project to leave it at the first quarter of 2020 because then um, international communication is pretty much overwhelmed by, um, by the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, maybe normal communication would change. So um, what we did was uh, using a text analysis tool called Decipher, we analyzed these speeches. This tool uses um, a, an AI bottom-up approach that detects the words and then uh, categorizes them into different categories. So we have, for example, I don't know, um, national objectives, progress, agriculture, health, population, you know, different, different, um, they assign words into these different topics. Um, some of them are characterized as positive, some are characterized as neg negative, so you can also assign words in this way. We then divided up the speeches by the audience, so we worked with five groups. We had a domestic audience, we had a general international audience, so this could be the United Nations or some international gathering, 
And then we had Asian, an Asian audience, a Western audience, which is basically basically the U.S. and the U.K., though there was some Europe in there, and an African, pan-African audience. Um, and so what we did, um, and I'd hoped to show you some pictures, but I couldn't figure out how to upload uh, my, my PowerPoint. What we found was um, that we looked over time and we saw a lot of these, a lot of this communication really had moved over time. So we saw, for example, um, looking at per country, we could see an effort to reduce, to increase the positive communication, actually the positive bar, the words that have positive associations increased, we saw a sharp decrease in negative communication. This was really interesting for us to see because you know a lot of things happened between 2015 and 2020. Um, like I said, it's different by country. So overall, we found that to a global audience, I mean, to almost every audience, they're stressing national progress. That's their most commonly communicated uh, topic. However, when you work with an Asian audience, the most commonly communicated topic in, in contrast to, to some of the other countries. And um, what we wanted to do was then to relate this quantitative analysis of the speech of presidents in this specific time period for these three countries and see whether there was any relationship with economic performance. And to think about economic performance, that's another can of worms, isn't it? We decided to go with country risk analysis and FDI. Now, ideally, it would be something bigger. It would be GDP growth. But so many elements go into play there that right now we're just not ready for that when it, it could come eventually. Um, and so we ran some regressions, you know, looking at the topics, the, the prevalence of the topics and their relationship with uh, foreign direct investment flows, net foreign direct investment flows, a percent of GDP. New countries this year. Um, we're going to be looking at Botswana, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, and either Tunisia. Tunisia, we're having language issues again, so we'll see. We could actually end up doing Nigeria instead, but we will see. Um, but we'd like to get a large enough sample, sticking to those years, presidential speeches, the same type of analysis, get a large enough sample so that we can say, okay, they were communicating like this between 2015 and 2020. In the period after 2020, did this communication strategy affect foreign investment in the country? Did it affect their political risk analysis, which investors look at when they're deciding whether to invest? Um, and so it's a narrow scope, but I think it's a very meaningful one. And I think um, as we incorporate more countries, uh, we're going to find some very, very interesting results. Thanks so much, Gail. I mean, there's there's so much to unpack in there. And and please, if any of you have any questions to throw at Gail or any <laughs> any points, I open this up. Um, open this up for conversation. I thought you know the some of the findings around how um, the discourse you know changes based off of the whether it's an Asian audience you know or whether it's a Western audience. I found that to be quite. Um, to be quite insightful. Um, Annie, I want to ask a question. So, I mean, you talked about how what's missing is, you know, sort of coherence and, and data. You know, what, so for example, with the results um, of, of this study, what are some of the things that we can use this data um, to do? You know, how do we, where do we take it from here, I would say? Um, uh, well, the idea of the, the the tool and the you know using the results was really to assist or to help um, uh, not only communicators but also decision makers um, across the continent and definitely the ones um, uh, in the countries uh, in the focus countries of the research. Um, the key takeaway here is that. Yeah, more African governments should actually plan their national um, narrative strategy because there's clearly lots of room for uh, improvement there. Um, and as Gail said, obviously, this is the beginning of uh, hopefully something uh, much bigger. 
but you know, when you look at it, um, there, there's always, um, I mean, we look at the political discourse and presidential speeches, uh, but there are other government initiatives that have that seem to have an impact or seem to have, yeah, seem to have an impact on uh, on the narrative. Um, the Sunshine Narrative, those Africa Plus One summits, uh, Africa is open for business forums, you know, all these uh, activities that we used to to monitor in the past years. When you consider those activities now, uh, in 2021, when everything seems to have, you know, stalled a little bit, um, and I know they're not a silver bullet, but you can still argue that they had a positive impact somehow mm -hmm. on how Africa is being perceived and mostly uh, within the business community, but also in a way by other government partners around the world. And in many cases, the private sector is really the one driving the whole process of change. Uh, and that's the little shift in narrative. But again, there's no data. so. Um, you can also argue that there was no systematic use of strategic communications to inform and to shape those activities, those Africa Plus One summits and business forums. Um, so the function was not used, I mean, the communication function was not used as a strategic function to guide those government activities before and after the events. And I think that's probably also where uh, we need more, um, more input and more effort. Mm -hmm. Eloine, I wanted to ask you um, just in terms of your thoughts on, you know, just how important data is. You talked about some of the work as well that Africa No Filter is doing. I feel like there's increasingly we're having a lot more, um, how do you call it? There's a lot more um, activity in this research area, right, to provide to provide data. What are your thoughts um, on this? Oh, you're mute. <laughs> ah. So I'm trying to unmute Elohim. I'm not sure if I can. Yeah, I cannot for my end. Oh no, we seem to be having some technical technical difficulties. <laughs> I'm also poor Elohim probably can't hear me saying that I'm trying to unmute her, but oh, no, she can. can hear you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least that's something I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not able to to unmute you. Okay, but I, th I think, Eloine, at least you could type your comments, so maybe we can, at least we can read them out. <laughs> and so while we're waiting, Felicia, um, do you have some thoughts um, on just the, the findings and the preliminary findings that, you know, that Gail has talked about and how even from a center perspective, um, you know, it, you know, we can use this to inform, you know, governments or strategic planning uh, for governments to impact narratives. Yes, certainly. I mean, you know, so I, so I think that it's really our job as a center to put a bunch of really, really smart people in the room uh, to come up with uh, with solutions that are actionable, so people that actually really want to impact this to make a change or uh, for the better can do it in a way that is data driven. Um, and so it is thing to sort of look at the lack of data and sort of be you know a bit um, you know a bit disappointed, and then it's really exciting. Uh, time to be able to create that data yourselves with people like, uh, like Gail and like Annie. So we have some comments coming in from, okay, <laughs> from uh, Eloine. Annie, you like, can you see the comments? Yes. Sorry, I'm on mute too. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't see the comments. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to find them now. Ah, yes. So, so Eloine, okay, yes. Yeah. So, being a lot more intentional about getting organized and taking an active role in making sure that our narrative um, is more balanced. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, um, and I, and this, this entire conversation is about that, right? Um, I think 